Good evening, Quaker Valley, and thank you for joining us virtually for this very important presentation tonight as we look at our new high school project. Back in March, we presented an in-depth look at why renovating and expanding our current high school is not the appropriate direction for our students, staff, and community, and the future of our school district. We committed to the community at that time that we would come back to you and present to you cost estimates for a new facility. The world got in the way and we have had some changes due to the pandemic that have demanded our attention and our students needed us, our staff needed us, and we have been making modifications to our educational plan since then. But we know the world has changed. We know that our lives have changed. But although we've had to shift, we've had to do some other work, we do remain steadfast that we would come back to you and bring this information to you about our pace, our finances, and how we will ultimately meet those needs. We know these impacts are real. The reality of, of COVID-19 is real. But every decision that we make is for the future. We will be thoughtful, collaborative, but I promise you realistic. I want to open by thanking everyone in the district for their ongoing service and attention, every member of the school board. You've really helped us adapt to the urgent needs of our students. And we know that we'll be talking about budget tonight. We've made some really big decisions, but tonight the facilities committee and our leadership team is ready to present to you our work and our research, along with the efforts of John Thomas, our program manager, the, the process that we've used to move forward and the information that we have tonight that will help us move forward to the next phase. The new high school has been many decades in the coming. There have been former school board members, superintendents, administrators over the year, committees, uh, parent groups who have talked about parking, who have talked about the building, who have talked about air conditioning many, many times before. Even Dr. Serloff, who is the former principal of the high school 15 years ago, he's going to weigh in a little bit tonight and share with you what even occurred in those conversations that occurred when he was the principal and the momentum that we've used from those conversations to move forward. And it became very, very apparent to me when I became the superintendent that this was an important project that needed immediate attention. So when I joined you about two years ago, I said I would listen. I would gather input. I would ask hard questions. I would use the information that you had. I would seek consultants when, when we needed to. I wanted to assemble the needs, the hopes, the dreams of a new school to address not only the 21st century um, in Quaker Valley and in our school district, but beyond. To date, we have done a great deal of work related to demographics, geotechnical studies, land surveys, educational program designs with consultants with brain spaces. We have brought community members together and we have worked really extensively as a team um, to talk about this project. We've even hired a new facilities, um, director of facilities, Charlie Goche. We've introduced him to you. And we're really using all of our expertise as a springboard. The task ahead of us has always been to use those resources, put them together, and put us on a very deliberate pathway. And, you know, we've looked at finances and we'll carefully examine those over the next several months related to those unexpected, unexpected challenges that we've had. Community input is vital. Ideally, we'd be sitting in the high school tonight and talking about this project um, and showing you different rooms and different facilities, but I share with you on our website, and I know Dr. Serloff will share with you tonight, different pictures of our, our buildings, many different presentations we've done to get us to tonight, so please don't hesitate to use our website and take a look at that. In this time of social distancing, my team has been working hard to collaborate, take information or questions from you, update our website, and, and do that through a social media platform. Our presentation tonight is, e is actually videotaped, so we are able to share it with you later on the website, but also to make sure that we um, virtually can bring this to you without bandwidth problems or presentation problems. We are committed to building the best community asset we can. We know that we have done due diligence, we have done extensive look at property, we have talked to many people, we have hired great people, and we want to make sure that you know that that information is available for you and it will be available to you tonight. Tonight we'll go over the essentials of the new project, look at optional features that could even move into the, well into the future. We've been able to identify the essential pieces of this project um, through our work with our program manager 
and I do believe you'll find this dialogue extremely helpful. I share with you that this presentation is rather lengthy. It, it needs to be rather lengthy. We have a lot of information and it will be time well spent so you can understand the work that has been, has been going on. But we thank you. We hope that you are taking very good care of each other and we look forward to being with you um, in person very soon. Please take care. And once again, as I always say, it's a great day to be a Quaker and it's a great way to spend some time with you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Serloff. I'm the Assistant Superintendent with the Quaker Valley School District. And the moment is finally here. Tonight is a very exciting evening. We are doing a presentation on the new high school facility. We're going to be talking about our process. We're going to be talking about costs. It's been four years in the making, and we know it's been a very long time. And we know the community has waited to have this information, and they've wanted to know as much as they can know about the high school project. We don't necessarily apologize for that because it does take time. The district has to make sure the information is accurate. They've done extensive studies. They've spent a lot of time considering all of the options for this project. And tonight we present the costs, the process we've gone through, and all of the due diligence that's taken place to lead us to this point in time. For those that were there in March, you'll recall that we did a presentation where we talked about the options for renovating the existing high school. And the conclusion that the board drew in 2016 is that a new high school is the best value for our children and our community. We re-emphasized and even put some costs in 2020 numbers on what a renovation project would have looked like and still came to the same conclusion. The best option for Quaker Valley is a new high school. Back in March, we talked about what a renovation and expansion project may look like. We talked about the fact that that facility, even if expanded, would still be inadequate. We would lose campus resources, green space, tennis courts. Those things would be gone in a renovation and expansion. And most importantly, most importantly, the impact on the educational experience of our children. There really is nowhere for students to be on campus if the current high school is renovated and expanded. It's obviously an economic consideration, what it would cost to have to bring portable classrooms and those things in, but ultimately having two to three cycles of students not have a high school experience, that's a very important consideration. So like I said, we presented that in March. If you are unfamiliar with that presentation, didn't get an opportunity to see it, we would encourage everybody to go to the website. If you click district and then blueprint QV, select high school project, news and articles, that March 10th school board presentation is there. In addition, while you're on the website, all of the due diligence, four years worth of presentations, due diligence studies, articles are on the website. Please, if you haven't seen that, this board has worked tirelessly with the administration over four years to get to this point. Please review that material. There's a great Q&A on there. There's a lot of community questions around a lot of topics uh, about the high school, from financing to referendum to due diligence. All of those things are answered in that Q&A section. Please review that information on the website if you haven't had the opportunity. In the conclusion that we reached in March was, even if we were to try to renovate and expand that current high school facility, what we would find is it is not a build-ready site. The current high school site is not a build-ready site. The expansion out over the back driveway onto that back hillside has several geotechnical challenges. It doesn't take away the major traffic congestion challenges we all know exist in the current high school. And there's a lot of other um, issues around deep foundations that would be, would be needed, soil conditions. There's a coal seam that actually runs along the back hillside. The current high school site for the expansion is not a build-ready site. Renovating the current high school would still be limited by the existing footprint. So even though we could build a larger section over the back driveway onto the back, the current shell, the walls that are load-bearing, things that are currently part of the box that is the existing high school can't be changed. So it's going to lead to poor layout and we're still going to have an antiquated structure that was engineered 100 years ago. And finally, renovation cannot occur without with students in the school. 
as we mentioned, serious disruption to their education. When we talked about this project in March, there were two significant conclusions I would draw your attention to at this time. Obviously, the cost of that renovation, approximately $72.7 .7 million, and the total gross square footage of the renovation and expansion at 216,000 square feet. What you're going to come to see in tonight's presentation is that's actually a larger facility than what is needed. By approximately 40,000 unusable square feet that would still have to be maintained, that would still cost quite a lot to heat, to cool, and be unusable awkward space, it is impractical to build a facility of that size for our student body. And when we talk about costs, the ultimate piece that we are going to share is we know the new facility is going to cost more than this $72 million, but the school board and the administration believes that that delta, that difference, has a tremendous value for this community and for the next 100 years. So what are our goals for tonight's presentation? We want to review the process that the district has gone through to acquire the land. We're going to spend a significant amount of time talking about the planning process and the scope that has led us to what we're calling the current program for the new high school. Very important to note, when we say program, we are not talking about final architecture, final engineering, design. That's the next planning phase. And we have our program manager here this evening. He'll be explaining what program management is and what it's not. And finally, the thing we know a lot of the community has been anxiously awaiting, what are those cost estimates for the new high school based on this now finished program? So let me take you back to the land acquisition phase. So this began in 2017 when the district hired Hannah Langholtz, Wilson, and Ellis to find at least 40 usable acres. That 40 acre number was a recommendation from the Pennsylvania Department of Education surrounding what an estimated size for a high school campus would be for a student population such as Quaker Valley. The brokerage firm provided 25 sites, both in and outside of the Quaker Valley School District, for the board to review. And in 2017, that was whittled down to 10 final sites. Things that were considered, topography, proximity to the current school. It was important to this school board that they find a site that is close to the current schools in close to our communities. Access of roads and utilities being near those property sites. Zoning, we know that's been uh, something that has come up before. Most of the schools in Quaker Valley are currently zoned in a similar fashion to this new site. They are special permission usage. And we are hoping that that same zoning allowance will occur for this high school because there is a tremendous partnership that we think this project can provide for the municipalities in conjunction with the school district. Things like stormwater management, better sewage management can come as a result of this project with the assistance of things along Camp Meeting Road. And finally, we really, the district wanted to find a site where there were no homes, the discussion of eminent domain never had to even come onto the table, and that there was a willing seller ready with a site that could be built upon for the new high school. So using that criteria, what was ultimately selected is the Three Rivers Trust property and some adjacent properties here in this section of the school district as it best met those criteria. And from 2017 up through the end of 2019, an extensive two-year due diligence process occurred before any final sales occurred on these properties with regard to land acquisition. And now that all of that property has been acquired and we have a program uh, in place, we look forward and we're very excited uh, to move on this project. Due diligence studies. There have been several studies done for the board to make a recommendation that this be the final site and for the district to want to move up to that property that has been acquired. There have been civil engineering studies, and you're going to hear a lot more about these when we get into the program management phase later on this evening. Geotechnical studies, environmental studies, looking at wetlands and things of that nature that are on the property. Architectural consultants, where does the building best situate on that site? 
all of these folks have provided tremendous valuable information and due diligence to the school board as they made their final decisions and recommendations. The district also brought educational consultants in to look at the educational program. Two in particular, first Maya Design, and Maya Design led a community level discussion and asked the stakeholders within our community what concepts were important to them. They used a human-centered design approach to take people through those facilitated sessions to glean from those community stakeholders what was important to them about a new high school campus. The second consultant was Brain Spaces, and Brain Spaces was more of a school model consultant. They bring a little bit of architectural background, but also a lot of educational background to the table. They met with faculty, they met with students, and they provided us with a model of what a high school of the future could look like. But important to note, the Brain Spaces consultant, that particular report, was not a final program. They did not provide us with final cost estimates. They did not provide us with final design. What Brain Spaces did is they said, here is everything that could possibly go into a high school of the future. And from there, they turned it over to the district and we to program management to run analytics and look at that study and say, okay, what do we need to narrow down to make a more accurate picture of what that program is going to be? And so all of those studies, all of that due diligence brings us to the point we where we are ready to talk about the educational program. So this evening we have John Thomas, president of Thomas and Williamson. He was our educational program manager and his presentation tonight will discuss the entire process and where we are now and how we move forward with the high school project. So, Mr. Thomas. Thanks, Andrew. First, let's talk about um, the completion of, of the planning phase, which, which was the charge that was made to me. Uh, re refine and set the base program and alternate program, but when I say the word program, the requirements for the project uh, and the functions that must be supported by the project's design. Refine and set the base program and alternate program for the site as well. So we're looking at the building, how the building needs to operate. We're also looking at how the site needs to function. That was a part of the study that the brain space has just touched upon, but it was if you're going to build a high school project, you have to outline all your requirements for the site as well. Associate the budget requirements with those base and alternate programs outline a schedule uh, to execute the project within, and then talk about the uh, delivery methods for how you'll go about designing the project. So uh, the a delivery method, a term that's used in construction, the organizational and contractual structural framework that uh, in which the project's design and construction will be carried out. The information that the school district gave me, first of all, was uh, the Stuman report, the demographic information the brain spaces study that Andrew mentioned, and the a very extensive report prepared by Phillips and Associates that was originally used as the due diligence uh, in the site acquisition uh, process. But I've found just a, a great amount of valuable information in that, in that study uh, that I used in formulating a lot of the recommendations in my report. There were also planning materials that were uh, provided by VEBH, uh, along with the Quattro Bonsi, and some cost information by uh, PJ Dick. The uh, historic information that was developed and maintained by the school district, uh, there, there have been, there's been an ongoing process, and they've collected a lot of information over almost 10 years uh, of, of time that I could see. The, uh, and finally, the educational programming information that describe how the facility operates now. So my process that I used was, uh, was first of all to get into the building planning, to do the site planning, to do cost modeling, to associate the cost with, with each of those. And at that point we could begin to talk about integrating the program and the cost. So that we could look at what was most important what wasn't as important and draw the conclusions of what, what is the what, what refinement leads us to the, the best value. Let's talk about the building planning. As part of that process, 
analyze the high school operations data, apply that course loading information to the brain spaces programming. So let's take how the, the school operates with its, with its current program and let's test it by putting it inside the brain spaces program and see how well it functions. Integrate that and right size the programming based on the, the anticipated operating schedule. That's not the current operating schedule. It's the current operating schedule plus what we would uh, determine would, would go into that schedule in the future. That formed the recommendations for the base and alternate uh, program components and gave me the net building area. There's a B portion to this. To, to do the test fit of the program spaces uh, within a, a conceptual building layout. So to do that, I looked at the, the groupings of the individual spaces and I'll show you the block and stack plans uh, tonight. Uh, I looked at the adjacencies and I took the block and stack plans and uh, put them into a shape to show how that might look uh, side by side with all the spaces in a building. Uh, that gave me the, uh, the, the building net area became converted to the gross building area, gave me the building shape and became the input for my cost modeling process. So the, the basic driving factors in getting to this program, therefore, are looking at the enrollment, how many kids are going to be coming through the school, uh, look at the educational program to show where the uh, most concentration of space, the highest concentration of space needs are. And those two components put together lead us to the, to the program. Number of students, courses offered, frequency of those courses, relationships to the courses uh, to determine the composition of the facility. And, and again, the types of educational spaces, quantity and quantity of each, uh, and how the spaces are grouped as functions to, to work as departments within a high school facility. Let's start with the enrollment projections. I took these from the 2015 Stuman study, and I also looked at the Pennsylvania Department of Education projections. They provide projections for every school district. So uh, Dr. Stuman gave you four scenarios. Two were increasing, one was decreasing, one was unchanged. The PDE projection showed that you were slowly increasing. And the actual condition was that after a decline in 2015, conditions have, have stabilized. And this is what that looks like. You can see that there are some of these lines that are going up. You'd have the yellow, the blue, uh, the gray, and the green. So that's the, uh, the uh, three increasing uh, projections that came two from Stuman, one from the, from the uh, state, there's also a green series, which is relatively stable, and there's even uh, another series in the red, which is slightly declining. I broke them apart, and I looked at where the differences were. And these are isolated parts of the forecast for the K-5, the 6 through 8, and the 9 through 12 grade groupings. You can see in the in the K-5 grouping that all of the differences in the projection actually occur during these, these grade levels. That if you look at 6 through 8, it's very stable and, and it's uh, following the black line, which is the actual enrollment. And same thing happens at the 9 through 12. So uh, my conclusion is that the only significant difference in the projections are at the K-5 6 through 12, all of the secondary is, is stable in every scenario. That leads us to when, when, we, when we look at applying the educational programming, the operations data to the enrollment, that we should expect the, uh, the enrollment to be stable and the educational programming to be stable. That any changes in educational programming would be new things that, that you add as you as you adapt the, the educational program to future times. So let's go into how I analyzed the, uh, the program. And I did this uh, by department. 
You have here an example of my breakdown of the math department as an example. And I looked at the number of uh, student periods per day, the, the, that is the number of students scheduled uh, in each course. I picked a sample semester. And then I also looked at which rooms are assigned to conduct those spaces and looked at their respective daily capacities. And I compared the utilization in the top table with the capacity in the bottom table. You can see in the pie chart that the utilization is at 69%. Now, some of you might look at this and say, uh, wow, it looks like we have a, a lot of extra room. Well, the first thing you need to consider is that you do have a practice within the school district of assigning one educator per room. So if there's a, uh, a designated off period for the, for the educator, that will manifest itself in the blue piece of the pie. If you uh, also consider that you can never run a facility at 100%. As a matter of fact, all the, all the data that I'm uh, incorporating into my study, I'm factoring everything automatically down to 90% for inefficiency. And that's because there's always a certain amount of inefficiency that comes in any, any high school schedule. I've picked 10% uh, uh, inefficiency uh, right off, off the top. Uh, the, the term that I'll, I'm, I've used on this, um, on this slide, and I'll use, it, I'll use it throughout my presentation, student periods. It's simply the number of, of students occupying a classroom space for one period. So it gives you the time element of the utilization along with the space that they're occupying. Again, this was done for every, uh, every department in the high school, and I've summed them up onto the onto the far right column, and I've showed which departments operate at the highest utilization rates. Uh, within this chart, there are, there are core subjects and there are non-core subjects. It's very common that you would see the non-core subjects in a high school run at a lower rate of utilization, and I'll get into that in the next couple slides. First, we have the non-core, I'm sorry, the, the core spaces. Uh, and it shows a, a grouping of all the rooms that are in the core classes, how many students are scheduled per day, what their capacities are, and uh, what their utilization rates are. I've also included a column to show the, the weighted uh, percent utilized. Uh, the weight is simply looking at the, uh, the amount of, of participation that, that's in a given space and counting it as a, uh, as a fraction of the overall facility. Did the same thing with the, uh, with the non-core subjects. And you can see that, as, as expected, that the non-cores run at a slightly lower, uh, lower percentage. So the, the first pie chart shows you the enrollment in the, in the core subjects, 60% uh, it is 66% is enrolled, leaves you a, uh, a, a the other scheduled spaces non-core in the 34%. When we look at the weight of the capacities, we have slightly less than that. We have 60% in the core, 40% in the non-core, meaning that there's a higher concentration of students in the spaces that, that are available for those subjects. Uh, and, and I know Andrew has a uh, he has a viewpoint on on, on uh, why this is important to him. Andrew, yeah, just something we've talked about. Um, Quaker Valley being a smaller high school, and I believe that this is the case. John, correct me, but um, when you're a small high school, but you have a large program, so we offer. You saw that list of math courses, a breadth of math courses for even a small population. Same thing in the non-core. We still have a band and an orchestra and a choir and an art program and a technology program just as large high schools would so we need those same spaces but our percentages and the numbers of students in those programs may be a bit smaller i think that leads to our um, utilization rates being as they are which would be considered normal as best i could say it for a school our size is that fair yeah. to say mr thomas yeah i think that um there when you're when you're planning a school there's always a uh, a tendency to want to 
compare yourself with with your peer school districts. And there there are peer school school districts that are peers uh, in the sense that you compete with them academically, but in a situation like this, you have to look at the peers that you have that you compete with as a function of your size. If you if you were to take a a, a much larger school district, they have no trouble at all running their core at a very high percentage. They also have no trouble at all in expanding their elective programs because they essentially have more customers, their students, to work into those programs. You don't have that ability at Quaker Valley, so you have to be very careful with your non-core to make sure that you don't overbuild the non-core. Down at the bottom of this chart, I'm also uh, giving you a, a, a total, total calculation showing that we're at 61.39% utilized in the core. Uh, a couple excluded spaces that are worth noting because they do factor into the overall uh, number of students coming through the school. You, you do have students in study halls. You have students in the library. That's not scheduled, but it's a, it's a, a, a functional uh, uh, operation inside the, 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 uh, the school. And I gave you a, the, the total uh, scheduled students on site with 605 that's that's on the average per period uh, you'll note that there's some missing they are at the in the parkway program part of the day this uh, stack bar chart I think drives home the idea of the of placing your your uh, capacity designing your capacity to suit to suit the highest loading and not designing it to support lower loading so we have the core in the yellow um, you want to you want to make sure that your your core spaces are adequate that you have enough of them and again be careful with the non-core because you you're only running at 50 percent if you built twice as many non-core spaces you would continue to run at that same same percentage. Uh, the brain spaces study. Let's let's talk about what I what I took from the brain spaces study. It was a very good report, and I, I'm sure that the process that they used was was, was very engaging. The uh, they looked at the types of learning spaces to support the existing educational program. Uh, and to look at new educational program objectives. They looked at groupings and the organization of the spaces and departments. Uh, they, they gave you a, a large wish list of things to think about, but they, they didn't look to, to prioritize what should be the base and what should be the, uh, the alternate program components. They left that up to someone like me to help guide you through. So let's start with um, my, my dissection of the, uh, of the brain spaces study. They did quite a nice job of breaking the, uh, the program into, into components, and, and there are five of them. The first one, as we just talked about, was the core. So in the, in the blue series, we have brain spaces original programming, 99 spaces, 49,000 that square feet, uh, with a total FTE capacity of 554. Now, I, I viewed that slightly differently. Uh, you'll, you'll see I changed the quantity, I changed the, the square footage, uh, and I added a new dimension to the analysis of the FTE capacity. So I started with a gross FTE capacity of 25 students per section. And again, like I said before, uh, I feel compelled, as they've always done with the PlanCon process, to factor that down. So I factored it down 10%, and I'm going to use the term adjusted capacity in the far right corner. That's my number that really stacks up against brain spaces. Brain spaces was using a smaller section capacity. Uh, they were using 20, I'm using 25. Uh, and I factor mine down, and, and, and in the end, we get very close to the same place. But you can see that I have far less spaces, 99 versus 65 on the right-hand side, 
and less square footage, but I'm, I'm accommodating the same amount of students. The second grouping, this is the uh, instructional activities. These include a lot of the non-core type functions. Uh, again, I've made a, I made a slight reduction in the quantity of spaces from 114 down to 96. I've made a significant reduction in the, in the square footage from 73,000 square feet down to 56,000 square feet. And, uh, and in the end, we end up with very close to the same uh, capacity. I'm slightly lower at 465 than their 420. The next grouping is the Learner Community Commons. This, uh, this space is not really a schedule driven, uh, these aren't schedule driven types of spaces. These are non-scheduled spaces. They had a, a total square footage of 40,000. I'm very close to that at 37,000. We don't see a lot of difference. I do have a, a capacity in here, but I believe it was the, uh, the, the health classroom was in that category and that will be scheduled so it's going to get get a capacity. Uh, these are these are uh, a lot of the uh, wide open uh, free thinking non-scheduled spaces that uh, I, I think there's another way of incorporating those in into your plans without specifically building open unoccupied spaces. The next category is it's an essential, but uh, no scheduled classes here. This is your offices and support. Uh, slight reduction in this. I went from 60 spaces down to 50. Uh, square footage is comparable. Next group, again, no scheduled spaces here. This is the building and facility operations category for your, uh, for your uh, janitors and maintenance areas the mechanical rooms, things that are just needed to support the building, the loading dock, et cetera. Here I actually, I actually raised this. I, I thought that there was more space that needed to go into it. I went from 28 to 32 and went up 3,000 square feet. On our total then, when I add all of the groups together, we went from 352 spaces to 293 uh, 177,000 net square feet down to, to 145, almost 146. And so there's a, there's a, a tightening of the, of the program here. Uh, there's another calculation here that just temporarily, I just wanted to, to gauge what the size of the facility would be using a, uh, a net to gross factor. Brain Spaces was using 25. Again, I've included some of the spaces in the, in the maintenance group uh, in, into the preceding tables. Uh, in as much as I've done that, I felt I needed to reduce that factor a little bit. So uh, my net to, to gross factor is 15% instead of 25. This chart gives you uh, an illustration of the, uh, of the breakdown of, of space with the core subject in the yellow and the non-core other scheduled spaces in the black. My concern with this was after running through the, my first run of the program that there was still a very high percentage of, of uh, non-core subjects in the, the space being made available. So I, um, I did another run. Uh, and I went through and I took out the, what I considered to be my first level of recommended alternates. That brought the, by eliminating those, those non-core spaces, I was able to bring this down to 429 and 531 in the capacities. That seemed to line up a lot better with the, the utilization that I could see in the master schedule. My next step of the process was to get into this block and stack uh, programming. I like to explain this as simply uh, a graphical version of accounting where I'm showing some very small spaces, some very large spaces, the gymnasium, and I've done that for every one of the departments that I just scrolled through in, in the brain spaces tables. So we have the instructional core, the instructional activities grouping, the uh, learner community commons spaces, the uh, main office, and the, the buildings groupings. So you can see these are relatively small in comparison. 
And if we go back and look at the, the first three, they really comprise the lion's share of the facility. The next step was to, to take those, uh, those spaces and uh, shape them into something that's building shaped. This isn't a design, it's simply uh, organizing them together uh, to put uh, compatible spaces beside each other and, and have them somewhat reflect what the shape of a building would be. Uh, and this, by the way, is something that I gleaned from some of your architectural studies that you had done where they were looking at a, at a uh, parallel corridor arrangement. This would be a large concourse in between the mostly public spaces and uh, some of the more private elective spaces. So everything, everything in your facility would adjoin this concourse if it had a public element to it. We mentioned earlier that the district had a study done by uh, Phillips and Associates and that it was rather comprehensive. These are the, the parts of that study. There was uh, surveying done, phase one and phase two environmental assessments, asbestos abatement, uh, studies done on the existing mansion that's on the property, wetland and surface water investigations, geotechnical to look at the subsurface conditions, site evaluation, they looked at the uh, at the, the slopes on the site and the, the roadways in and out. Traffic engineering, they even had someone come in and look at what kind of improvements could be made off-site to, to benefit uh, uh, putting the, the high school on this site. Preliminary grading plans, they looked at the uh, at, at property uh, title uh, components with, uh, with easements, and then they had an addendum to add in the Dohar property survey. Just as a reminder of where I am in my process, we've, we've worked our way through building planning. Now that we're going to talk about site planning, and that's going to, to lead into, the, into the, the tail end of this. So let's talk about the site planning measures that I looked at. Uh, site programming, uh, this, was, this was not really part of the, of the brain spaces study, but as you, you'll see, there's quite a few important things that you have to add on the site to support the building. Uh, I needed a conceptual layout to, to begin an invest, uh, investigation of the grading, conceptual grading plans, and uh, cut and fill calculations. One of the things that is always necessary when you're dealing with a site this large is uh, uh, to include some degree of reiterate, reiteration and refinement in your process. And I went through uh, three reiterations of the of the concept, the layout, and the cut and fill before I got to a place where I was comfortable. And then that gets us to the point where we can make recommendations for what should be in the base program as well as the alternate site program. And then uh, use that information as input into my cost model as well. Uh, let's look at what Phillips laid out for us here. They, they, uh, they gave us a lot of this information that we could use. I thought we needed to, uh, to to verify the opportunities and limitations for citing the building. Phillips didn't have a uh, a uh, a hybrid plan to work with. We we now have that. The determination of the optimum development elevation and area again that is part and parcel to the first one. Uh, consider the site programming development options. Look at how you can incorporate. Uh, things like stadiums and athletic facilities into your plan or not include them in your plan. Uh, consider design features to minimize risk associated with the development and operations. Uh, look at, look at the, uh, the site. I know everybody's familiar with what happened down Route 65 a number of years ago. Look at ways to minim minim minimize those risks. Um, Consider residual benefits to the surrounding properties. What can we do that makes us a good neighbor, that makes this site development beneficial to all? And then, of course, find a way to minimize the development costs. Here's the base option. Just to orient everybody, this is Camp Meeting Road coming down this side of the sheet. Uh, and, and on my, my first, uh, first background, 
I want to show you where the ridge is on the property. This is the highest point, and it, it's not a straight through ridge. It, it wiggles around a little bit. It, you come into the site at elevation of 1100, drop down to 1090, and then back up to 1110. So uh, there is a way to, to kind of streamline this, this ridge and keep the elevations consistent. Uh, the name of the game, however, is to minimize the amount of work that you do on either side of the ridge. That will eliminate uh, having excessive fill slopes. So this first uh, shape that I'm showing here is the disturbed area. Even though it's not a complete flat spot that everything's been developing, developed on, this is the area that you would disturb to go in and create that flatter spot. So this is my, uh, my disturbed area and it's showing uh, the overall perimeter, you might say this is where the, the erosion and sedimentation controls would be set up on this perimeter. The next step was to get to this development plateau. What would the flat space be shaped like? So my development plateau is the portion of the site that has to be graded to a reasonable uniform elevation. Not completely flat, but traversable. And this um, reduces our, our, our site area to 27 acres of flat developed space. I think some people in the past have talked about having development plateaus as large as 50 or more acres. Uh, I just saw that as excessive. I, I think maybe the, the development of, of that larger plateau was in response to the question, how big of a plateau could we possibly develop? Not that we need to develop it that large, but how large could it be? My uh, approach to it was let's find one that is the size that we need it to be. From there I, I superimposed a, uh, a, a rough sketch of what the shape of the building would be like, the, uh, the parking lots immediately around that area, a uh, pedestrian concourse leading to the building, a road in, loops around, second way out, both adjoining camp meeting. So some of the highlights of this plan, main site entry, secondary site entry, building elevation at 1090, flat area for an athletic field. And you can see that it's, it's, in, the, it's in the shape of a stadium configuration with a, a, a running track, no stadium there, but uh, it, it, if you develop anything, you would want to leave this flat space here just to be a, a developed field for, for athletics. Uh, the base amount of parking space is 277 on this side, 251 on this side. I think you have uh, 218 spaces at your existing high school. So we are more than doubling the amount of parking on the site. And I think you can see there's, there's plenty of opportunity to expand that parking over uh, to the to the west and to the east so that you could put even more parking in if you needed it. Now the, the, the part of this that when I first did this first first scheme I wasn't wild about it. Uh, I have a, a two to one fill slope to the back and a two to one fill slope to the front. Uh, there, there is some filling going on uh, over on this side associated with the second roadway but these were, the, these were the slopes that I was most concerned about. There is a residential development down here in, uh, in Leedsdale. And if it, was, if it was possible, I wanted to try to come up with other ways of laying the site out to avoid having this fill work here. So let's look at the, let's look at the site layout options. We have adding tennis courts to the site, adding a stadium to the site, and over the, the Edgeworth line, which is uh, approximately right here, we could look at having a recreational, uh, recreational field and some green space there. I would, I would not propose that you, you develop any, uh, any buildings across that line. Let's look at the option one. So that was our base option. Let's look at option one. Same concept again. The ridge is in the same place have a development area, reducing a little bit, comparable, development plateau, a little bit smaller. 
but you can see on, on this rendition, we have a minimized amount of grading on the, on the back side. There's still some grading here, still this grading here. But this, is a, this was a huge improvement over the first one. It brought the cost down significantly. Uh, and it, it did require the addition of a retaining wall to, to help minimize that amount of grading on the, on the Leedsdale side. Building elevation dropped down slightly. Flat athletic field as we proposed in the first. Same amount of, same amount of parking, uh, divided up slightly differently. And there are our fill slopes. Let's move on to option two. Option two, we have a, again, a comparable disturbed area. We have a development plateau, comparable again. But you can see that the shape of that development plateau has changed. Now, there is no fill slope on the, between the, the, Skype, the, the school site development and the area where uh, Leedsdale is. All the fill slopes are away from, from that residential area. So what this is doing is taking advantage of the topography that's there. It makes the, the, the roadway uh, with, with a gentle wind in it. However, it, it, it does so by eliminating a lot of risk. So this is where I started getting to the point where I felt that the, the site was, was really uh, really uh, feasible and there was uh, a way of doing it with minimal risk. Also in this design I've, I've, uh, I've included the recommendations from your traffic consultant Wooster which moves the, uh, the location of Camp Meeting Road, it's currently here, moves it over a little bit to improve this, the sight lines. So just to recap, we have main site entry per Wooster, secondary site entrance, driveway moving along with the elevations, small retaining wall to accommodate that, building elevation back to 1090 in this one, flat athletic field, parking spaces. So one of the things I wanted to point out about uh, what made this site so advantageous is, as we talked about at the beginning, location. So the current high school is down here in the Leedsdale area, so the site's very close. We were able to get that 40 plus acres that we need to disturb to get to that final 27 to 28 acre campus. Some of that disturbed area will still be nice uh, trail space and other outdoor space. But I think another major factor is although most of what is surrounding this area is hillside, it's forested hillside. And so the board saw this as a great opportunity to have a safe and secure campus, but also have a nice separation so that the high school campus would fit into this community setting and provide the residents with a great deal of still wooded separation space between the campus and the home. So thank you. Thanks, Andrew. So that's an important point. So I just have option three, which is just a very slight uh, Im uh, improvement over, over option two. That's actually option two R because we did have some earlier re reiterations of that. Uh, in this one, seeing the seeing the, the opportunity over here with the, the, the moved roadway per the Wooster study, I saw that it could be advantageous to uh, to rotate that athletic field or future stadium if you ever choose to do that, uh, and it ma makes it a little further from the road and it works in with the contours just a, a little bit better. So that's option three. Again, a lot of the same features that you saw in option two. All right, to the final part of our process. So we, um, we went through the building planning, the site planning. Let's go into the cost modeling. So my process here is to compile the interior models. If you um, recall the discussions we had back in March, there was an estimate that I put together for the renovation of the of the existing school. And I was using uh, cost information that I put together for the high school, for the, for the new high school. Uh, building out the interior isn't 
all that different whether you're building it out in a, in a new shell or an old shell. In, a, uh, in an old building shell, you have to put the demolition work in, into it. But in a, uh, in, in, a, in a new building shell, you have to add some uh, so slightly more infrastructure to make that work. Uh, the, the, the interior models, they're, they're transformable from shell to shell. The second part is to do the shell models. And this is where you see the, the, the large difference. This includes the structure, exterior skin, and the MEP mains. MEP meaning the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. From there, uh, I incorporate the information that I had prepared on the site plans that I just showed you to do. These aren't so much modeled, but we, we do have a standard price list we use to develop the, uh, the, the cost of the site. And then at that point, we can start applying the, looking at them as to whether they're base or alternates uh, in a selection table that I made and uh, apply the soft costs. The soft costs being the fees, permits, testing, surveys, uh, contingencies, financing costs, furniture, equipment, etc. After that's all done, we can review the cost associated with the individual program components and groupings. That is where you uh, are taking advantage of the services that I'm providing you. And you can decide now what you want to have in your project. Let's talk about the estimated project cost. So first, let's look at the base. We, we have two large components of the base, the building cost, and there's a, a large list of, of spaces that are included. They're in my document 1.1.2.1. Uh, then we have the, the site cost. The, there are two components of the site cost, the bulk site development and the site finishes. The bulk site development, again, I'm going to use option two here, uh, includes bulk cut and fill for the, for the buildings and the roadways, uh, athletic field development as lawn areas, site utilities on and off site, your uh, stormwater management, uh, all, the, all of the uh, other utilities that are five feet outside the building perimeter, maintenance of the erosion and sedimentation controls. So you can think of this as the component where you've come in and prepared the site for the development of the building and the final facilities. And in that final development, you would have the site finish work, as I call it. Your, your final cut and fill, fine grading, not bulk grading, moving uh, thousands of cubic yards, but just fine tuning the grades in and around the building as it's constructed. Your flat work, uh, sidewalks, curbs, uh, islands, your landscaping, site appurtenances, and uh, fences and gates, and a, a number of other uh, pieces of, of uh, accessories that go on, on the site. For the building, in the alternate program, we have the physical education uh, health classroom as an alternate, the uh, business lab marketing classroom, the additional space to include uh, future fit out, and the addition of a slope metal roof for selected areas. As, an alternate, as alternates on the site, we have uh, potentially adding a recreational field over on that Edgeworth area and uh, tennis courts as well. Here's what, here's what was, was estimated and reviewed, but is currently not included in the project scope that we would be, be recommending. A uh, field house, black box theater, uh, these are all building elements, uh, orchestra room and administrative office uh, fit out. On the site, uh, we would not add an additional recreational field. There would be one, but not two. And we would not add the athletic stadium. Let's look at a table here that shows you the, uh, the, the breakdown of these costs in both the categories of base and alternate. So in the base, you can see I have the, the hard costs for the building and the site, the, the uh, soft costs that go along with those hard costs for the, the total costs. So with a uh, a building cost of just over 62 million, hard and soft, and a site at almost 19 million. We have a, a, a base building cost of almost 81 million dollars, 80 million 820,288. 
in the alternate category, when we add in those other items that uh, are the highest priorities, we add another 4.4 million uh, to the building and another 1.7 million to the to the site cost for a, an addition of of uh, 6.1 million dollars, taking the recommended uh, base plus alternates to almost 87 million. Important to note, those items that I said were not included, they uh, total $17 million. So uh, I know Andrew has, uh, has worked with me on this uh, quite closely to, uh, to come up with, with this list and uh, share his endorsements of which ones were the highest priority. I'm sure he would like to say something about where that fits into the, the total price tag. Yes, thanks, John. So just to re reiterate, uh, when the program uh, was brought forward, there was a base program. There was a number of alternates, some which we are recommending at this point and some which we are reserving uh, for discussion at a later time. So it was only fair to price every possible alternate that could be developed on the site. But the administration and the board at this point is recommending a distinct focus on student spaces, academic spaces, and school spaces, and looking to reserve uh, the more expensive alternates like an athletic stadium for a later time. So as Mr. Thomas said, at this point, those academic recommendations around the school, school facility, and the add-on alternates that are academic add-ons are approximately $87 million and fair to put a range of 85 to 95 million, there may be some small, uh, less costly alternatives in this category that depending on budget, depending on final design work and final engineering, could be worked into this project, but the range is to, at this point, be an 85 to 95 million dollar project. Thanks, Andrew. I just wanted to, um kind of put you in the in in the context of where you are time wise with your with your project uh, and I'll, I'll get into the next steps in a minute but before I do that uh, you will go th the project will go through a, uh, a process the plan con process and the, the plan con process is a uh, system that's used by the Department of Education to help monitor your project the, the, the process is recently, last year, just adopted in March, has changed a little bit. It used to be uh, plan con parts A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then some post-project uh, uh, portions of the, of the process. Now they've streamlined it a little bit. Part one is project justification, your district-wide study. Uh, part two is your uh, your construction documents, and again, there's some some inner workings with with the, uh, the Department of Education at, at that stage. Then they'll see you again after you bid your bid your projects and before you award, and then you'll see them again as you close the project out. And then again in the future, they want to come back and and check in with you a year after you've completed the project to conform your Act 34 adherence. So this term, Act 34. It's known as the Taj Mahal Act. It's Act 34 of 1973. Uh, anytime you're doing a project that is uh, larger than, uh, that makes your building 20% larger than it is now, or if you build a new building, you have to go through Act 34. And Act 34 does a number of tests on the, on the size of your, of your facility to make sure that you aren't building a Taj Mahal. So the first time you'll, you'll uh, broach the subject of, of Act 34 is in Part 1. You'll have an Act 34 determination to verify that the project is uh, indeed an Act 34 project. We know it's a new building, it will be Act 34. The, the, the second part is to look at the compliance to, to make sure that you are uh, counting things in the right categories to go against the Act 34 and that you're not spending too much money. That, that happens again at, uh, at part three, when your bids come in, they're, they're going to want to make sure that your bids don't exceed your Act 34 amount. And then, in fact, then this was something that wasn't done before, and I think it's a great idea, to make sure that 
that after you've completed the building that uh, you as the district didn't sneak in and add other things to your project. They'll check in with you a year after completion to make sure that your uh, Act 34 adherence is still intact. A couple next steps that are coming up. Uh, again, my whole effort uh, was, was to get everybody uh, understanding, having a common view of the program and the costs associated with it. And we've, we've achieved that, that uh, goal at this point. Uh, the next step is to, to seek out the professionals that are going to take you through the rest of the way of your, in your project. Architects and engineers, a construction manager, they will further develop the design criteria. Uh, there will be continued engagement of the community on their conceptual design and other uh, refinements of that design as they go through their process. They will develop the construction documents, put it out to bid, and then a, uh, a bid review will be conducted before you sign contracts with contractors to, uh, to, to do this project. Thank you, John. So, um, like the mission of the school district, this presentation has been put together uh, to empower this community and this board and this administration uh, to design what is the very best future for Quaker Valley High School students. And the goal of the presentation tonight was to share that information, show you how the board reached the decision that building a new high school was what was best and what was the best value for this community and for its students. And at this point in time, we will be taking questions from the board regarding this presentation. Thank you.